right. Marty and I were having uh -huh. that discussion last night, so it was very interesting. Great to see everyone today. Uh, I'm glad everybody's back in the room. I wish I was there with you. It was a wonderful day yesterday and really enjoyed the discussions and everything that was taking place. Uh, so wonderful to, wonderful to be here with you this afternoon. As Marty mentioned, we're, we're talking about crypto or, or somebody suggested yesterday crypt. And we just dropped the O. <laughs> um, but I want to be all doom and gloom because I, I think the people on this panel, you know, have a lot of great insights, business instincts, uh, thoughts. And, uh, you know, we're going to get into some where are the opportunities in this and how's this going to play out? So really quickly, let me just tell you who's on our panel. We have Anthony Apollo, CEO of Renza Games. We have Frank Amato, who's managing partner of uh, A100X Ventures. We have Alexander Gloy, owner of Lighthouse Investment Ma uh, Management. Joe Duncan, who's listed as a visiting lecturer from Columbia Engineering. Uh, but he is so much more than that. He has a very interesting background in the crypto space, including you know, some international experience from the Far East. So we'll we'll get in that discussion as, as we talk this af afternoon. And then we have Pablo Jodar, who is actually, uh, are you in Spain? Is that where you are, Pablo? I'm based in, in Switzerland, but currently I'm in Spain, yes. Switzerland, okay. Currently you're in Spain, but you're from Switzerland. Now we got it straight. So he's gonna bring again, more of a European <laughs> view to this. So it's gonna be a very interesting discussion. We're gonna talk, touch on a lot of uh, different topics, including you know, the coins, hedge, crypto hedge funds, regulations, DeFi, DApps, Meta, 3.0, blockchain, all, all the usual buzzwords. My name's Mark Heil, I'm with Pacific Premier Trust. We are a division of Pacific Premier Bank. Uh, we're a leading custodian of, uh, of alternative assets, particularly in the self-directed IRA space. Uh, we do do uh, a, a fair amount in crypto, but as of yet, we don't allow our investors to touch the coin. That's the the one sort of soft barrier we have right now. And there's some discussions going on, and hopefully by the end of the year, we will be able to allow that. So um, the, the institutional asset, the institutional team at Pacific Premier Trust works with RAs, broker dealers, and family offices. Uh, I mentioned this yesterday, but you know uh, we're currently working on a fund custody deal to hold some loans, about three billion dollars worth. We're working with an RAA that uh, uh, had a large private equity fund. They're committing fifty million dollars to it, and we're we're helping them out by getting retirement funds into that. Uh, we're we're also working with a. Uh, uh, with a large asset manager who wants to allow his employees to invest in their co-invest fund using the retirement dollars. He figures it's a good way to attract people to his firm and keep them there. So those are, are just some examples of how we get involved. But one of the problems I have is I work for a bank that I work for a trust company that's owned by a bank and I have to read a disclosure. So let me go through this very quickly and then we'll dive into our conversation. Uh, information is presented for educational purposes only and is not intended as and may not be relied upon as tax, legal, investment, or other advice. Pacific Premier Trust performs the duties of a custodian and as such does not evaluate, recommend, or endorse any particular investment opportunities. You are advised to consult your professional advisors for specific guidance regarding your investments Investments are not FDIC insured and are subject to risk, including the loss of uh, principal. Uh, for those of you who've seen panels that I've run for Marty, you know I like to run them as a conversation. You're invited to participate in this conversation. So if you have a thought or a comment, please don't wait to the end of the program to ask it. Ask it when it's relevant. Ask it when it's on the top of mind. I would love you to have the join in. Join in. Only thing I ask is you be respectful. These panelists have spent time preparing for this, uh, so I don't want to filibuster going and, you know, for, for them to get sort of short shorted on their time. So with that, let's let's get them to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their firms and their backgrounds. Anthony, I'm going to throw it over to you first. Tell us a little about Rensa Games, and then, you know, uh, we'll, we'll we'll move on from there. 
Sure. Thanks, Mark. So my name is Anthony Apollo. I am the founder and CEO of Rensa Games. Rensa Games is a video game development and distribution company built on the Ethereum blockchain. What we allow developers to do is upload completed games to our platform. They are able to specify their price, the number of licenses they want to create to sell that game. Uh, and they can also list the digital wallet addresses of any of their collaborators or co-creators. What that allows them to do is when their game sells through our marketplace, they get paid in real time as opposed to 60 days, which is generally the industry practice. And any of their collaborators who they've specified can receive a revenue share or a royalty in real time as well. Um, that is the distribution tech we have already. Going forward, we're working on the development side of the gaming space as well, where creators will be able to make their own games in a in-browser environment using tokenized assets uploaded by anyone else who's created anything on the platform. That could be a 3D object, that could be a piece of music, that could be an entire physics engine. Um, close analog to that with something like Roblox or Minecraft, things that focus on what we call user-generated content. Um, but without kind of the walled gardens that those programs present. Uh, as a quick note, my background, I spent a number of years in finance and consulting, got into the blockchain space around 2015 from an investment perspective, uh, joined a company called Consensus, which was an Ethereum incubator based out in Brooklyn uh, in 2017 to work on a decentralized science fiction franchise called Solarius. Worked on that for a little over a year transitioned to working with a player on the Brooklyn Nets named Spencer Dinwiddie to do a debt security token, had a little bit of a shared DNA between a Bowie bond and then um, a company called Fantex, which is doing equity stakes in football <coughs> players. And after that project wrapped in 2020, went independent to work on what is now Rents Games. We've been live for about three months. We're just getting started and uh, picking up momentum quickly. <coughs> Sounds terrific. Uh, Frank, why don't you follow on? Tell us a little bit about your background in A100X uh, Adventures. It's, is Frank not in the room? Uh -huh. Oh, apologies then. Uh, Alexander, why don't you then go? Alexander sure. Gloy, owner of Lighthouse Investment Management. So my background is uh, from the investment banking side. I was uh, head of European equity research at Credit Suisse Private Banking in Zurich. Uh, now managing a little bit uh, money for family and friends. But from questions from customers, I got uh, pushed into the crypto space because they always wanted to know if they should buy this latest Jesus coin or that coin. And uh, so I, I caught interest from a uh, the perspective of, of uh, our monetary system, could uh, crypto or Bitcoin be a, a replacement of our uh, monetary system? And I'm, I'm writing on, I'm trying to write a book on the future of our monetary system because I think we have the cusps of uh, pretty big changes uh, uh, coming up. And uh, that's why I, I, I love exchange of ideas uh, also for my book. Gotcha. And Joe, why don't you go next? Oh, there is Frank now. I apologize, Frank. How are you? Um, but anyway, Joe Duncan, uh, visiting lecturer for Columbia Engineering. It sells you short, so please fill us in. Yeah, OK. So um, I uh, work on Wall Street firm readers. I was a trader, a derivatives trader. And then in um, 2010, given what I saw in uh, technology going on and also growth of Asia, I made a bit of a career pivot. I mean, I always had an interest in both. I was a derivatives trader on Wall Street. And I moved to uh, Singapore. I was there for about eight years where I, I took on the task of uh, both venture investing and advising. And it was there that I first saw crypto being used for cross-border payments. So you have very active developer communities. Uh, a lot of times they're from like the Philippines and they would send remittances back to the families in the Philippines and they'd use like Bitcoin and then later on Ethereum when Ethereum came up. And it was much better than what they used to use before, which is called Philippe, which is like a Western Union. So that's one of these horror stories where you hear people sending $200 overseas or family paying $50 to do it. So that, that's just a horrible situation. So, you know, my first kind of impression was quite positive, you know, helping people's lives better. And then I first uh, traded it in 2014, around the time of the, at the time of the, what's called the Mt. Gox bankruptcy. So that was a centralized exchange out of Tokyo that went belly up. Um, I knew some people in Singapore who had, had some crypto wallets. Basically, they couldn't get their Bitcoin out to pay their Singapore dollar expenses. So we just did a, you know, an off-market exchange where I, I give them some Singapore dollars and they set up some Bitcoin wallets for me. 
Um, you know, look, I, I didn't really understand all the things about the blockchain at the time. I understood the stress. I understood looking at charts. That was good enough at the time. 2017 was really the game changer for me. It's something where I said, okay, I've really got to understand this stuff. Um, I did an arbitrage trade where I, you know, typically arbitrage is short one exchange, long another. So I was short a centralized exchange. I went through my, you know, Wall Street exercise of coming up with the counterparty risk. The, uh, what's called the hazard rate was the, uh, the, the odds that they wouldn't honor their obligation was about 30%, so very high. That's a very high, let's call it default rate. And so that's on the central, that's the short side, which had to be a centralized exchange. And then my long position was on the Bitcoin mainnet. So I, I go through this exercise again, and I'm trying to come up with a counterparty risk weighting for holding coins in the Bitcoin mainnet. And no matter how many ways I looked at it, I couldn't come up with a risk weighting other than zero. And I was like, basically, this software protocol has the same risk weighting as like trading against the trading with the CME. It's like, well, this is a game changer. I've got to figure this out. So that was 2017. So that's when I did a deep dive and basically said, everybody leave me alone. Don't talk to me until I get this. And I said, when's that going to be? I said, well, until I get it. That's when it's going to be. That's how profound this is. Um, and then I moved back to New York, um, I guess the next year, yeah, 2018, uh, for family reasons. I wanted my kids to, to start their education in, in the US system. And I'd done a lot of blogging and keynotes and some people from Columbia University, as uh, Mark said, had, had reached out to me. They liked the stuff that I talked uh, spoke about and wrote about and um, struck up a relationship. And then um, we uh, co-authored a book called uh, Blockchain Investor Manual. And then I co-teach a course there, yes, in the engineering department on blockchain investing. And then I also uh, advise, um, you know, still investment project, advise ultra high net worth investors, you know, on their blockchain and crypto strategies. Thank you for that. I, I greatly appreciate it. Um... Uh, I want to move over now to, to Pablo, and Pablo, if you do us a favor, he's the executive director for Sky Financial, uh, and as well as Storm. So maybe you could tell us about both those organizations and how they work together. Thanks, Mark. Yes, uh, my name is Pablo Holler. I'm Spanish, uh, but I'm based in, in Zurich, in Switzerland, and I work for Sky Financial, that is a Swiss company financial intermediary, intermediary where we offer uh, financial products for family offices, ultra high net worth individuals, private banks that want to access the market, but they don't really know the space or they don't find in their banks uh, suitable products or attractive products. And Storm Partners is our holding company and it's a consultancy uh, firm focused just on blockchain and uh, crypto projects. We are members of the Crypto Valley Association, which is one the, the biggest uh, hub for crypto projects in Europe. And um, we serve different type of companies, NFT uh, protocols, even big companies like, like banks that they want uh, to know more about the technology, about the, the business opportunities. So we also offer training programs uh, and workshops for, for them. Now. And regarding my background, uh, I'm younger than, than you, obviously. I'm not an engineer. I studied business and law. And I started in this uh, space in 2016 after doing an internship at Goldman Sachs in London, where I first heard about the, the technology. And when I, when I heard the, the word blockchain, I was like, what's this? No. So when I got back home, I started reading, 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 and I really got caught by by the benefits no? and the implication of the technology. No? And I thought, look, this is a really uh, revolution. No? And it's not only applied to finance, but also applies to insurance, logistics, like every sector. No? So since then, I came back to Spain. I tried to launch a project there on tokenization of real estate. Um, but at that time, the regulator they didn't know what blockchain was and, and, and Bitcoin. So it was impossible. They told me, look, uh, you, you seem like you have a good idea, but we are not prepared. We don't have any uh, legislation here. No? So I went uh, to Switzerland. I started working for JP Morgan for almost four years covering uh, ultra high net worth individuals. And this is how everything started uh, with the Sky Finance. And now I found that there was a necessity in the market. My clients were asking me, hello, what are the opportunities? How can I access not only Bitcoin, Ethereum, or any other crypto uh, or coins, but 
how can I access that gateway? You know, how can I participate in this revolution from from inside? No, and then uh, I said, look, it's, a, it's the time now to join forces with the storm that they have the network, they have the expertise, and they are uh, providing services to these new projects that are coming out and put these projects in front of these uh, investors. So, fantastic. We'll look forward to diving in here and more of your thoughts, particularly around, you know, different opportunities and, and companies that are now merging off this technology. Uh, but let's get to our, our last uh, panelist here. Frank, I, I, I saw you were in before. I guess we needed to get you upgraded to a speaker status, and I'm glad Marty took care of that. Yeah, apparently you relate with your payment to Marty. <laughs> uh, no more bitcoin please just gold. <laughs> so great to be here my name is frank amato i'm a um, former commodity derivative trader for jp morgan uh, i had about an 18 year career at that institution all on the precious metal side um hence my interest in early in bitcoin an asset that was acting as store of value but not was was not issued by a central government or authority so I bought some in 13 on the U.S. Marshall's auction of Silk Road coins, and then not wanting to have my eggs in one Bitcoin basket, I joined uh, uh, Angelus Syndicate Blockchain Capital. And from there, we did equity investments across some of the incumbents in the space now, like Tyrion Gem, Abra, BitPesa. I was the first check into BitMEX Exchange, which at one point was the largest derivative exchange uh, in crypto. And I retired out of JP in 15. I've focused in the space since as an angel advisor or both. And I'm really happy to be joining Nisa Moyle's uh, Fund 2 A100X uh, as a seed series A stage institutional grade venture fund. Fantastic, Ed. Alex, I'm going to start with you and I'm going to take the stress investing for about 2 billion. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, bad joke, I know, but I couldn't resist. We got Alex uh, on on the panel here. Actually, said, <laughs> um, about, uh, so anyway, Alex, just to take it, uh, it, carry it forward. About a month ago, Marty had a crypto panel, and at the time, it was selling around uh, thirty thousand at the time Bitcoin. Since then, it's fell to about twenty thousand. Uh, several chain exchanges began to announce layoffs. Some exchanges even stopped trading or, or, or froze up. Uh, but still, in the last couple of weeks, we see Goldman announcing it's raising $2 billion to acquire Celsius. Uh, and Morgan Creek is, is interested in FTX are actually bidding against each other on BlockFi. We have Terra UST crash, and then suddenly this week, a sudden resurgence in that. Uh, so, and also, I, I think I read that the FTX is trying to buy Robinhood. So a lot of things are happening in, in this marketplace and I'm hoping you'll help make some sense of what's going on. Uh, mergers, consolidations, uh, lower prices. You know, how does somebody find alpha in here? How do they make some money for their investors? Well, uh, the big problem is, of course, that uh, Bitcoin has no PE, no dividend yield. Uh, so in, in my opinion, it's it's impossible to, to value it. Uh, and all, all the, the theories about scarcity, uh, I think they are they are bogus. I mean, uh, uh, if, if it was about scarcity, then, then platinum should be more valuable than gold, but it's worth less uh, than half than gold. And uh, the um, the potential supply in gold as well as in Bitcoin is always uh, in gold. It's all above ground gold, so 200,000 tons. It's not just the 3,000 tons that are mined annually. And in Bitcoin, we mine now 19 out of the 21 million uh, possible coins, and that's that's the that's the potential supply. Uh, so <coughs> how, how are you going to calculate a fair price with that? It's it's impossible. So, and and I think it's it's sad that uh, Bitcoin. Are, a beautiful idea, a decentralized, removed from government interference, potential future money has been financialized, re-centralized and become a, a, a play ball of, of speculation. And I think we're uh, collectively giving away here a chance of, of building a new uh, monetary system. And uh, so how anybody would make money. I, I think for retail, the experience is mostly in the in the in the coins. It's not even in Bitcoin, and there it's mostly rug pulls. So ninety nine percent of people will be very discouraged. Will have lost a lot of money, or worst case, 
the mother's uh, uh, 401k and uh, be totally turned away. And then the central banks will come and, and say, so these things all crashed. And, and here we have this shiny new central bank digital currency. And this is our answer to, to the, the, the uh, building crisis in, in our monetary system. And uh, it's all good that you can then uh, instantly send your CBDC to somebody in, in, in in Asia or whatever, but it doesn't solve the, the problem of of um, uh, of, of uh, money printing and and uh, uh, we we don't want to end up with uh, a, a piece of paper that says one trillion uh, dollars of, of central Zimbabwe. bank of Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. but uh, you can even have buy a five billion one for two dollars. <laughs> <laughs> you can't even buy an egg for that. I am and, a, I'm from Rhodesia. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and you say, well, then, uh, you know, we don't have to be in, in, in uh, you don't save in, in money. Money is for everyday transactions, but all your investments are denominated in the same thing. And uh, so, the, so is it true that the only real, if you're going to take advantage of the transferability, transferability in secret and in and facilitation of, of transfer, that the real only Bitcoin that's worth anything on the dollar the dollar matched um, types. Yeah. Stable coins. Stable coins. Yeah, oh, yeah well, stable coin is um, the, the, you're they to have the, the value of the dollar. Yeah. So yeah. but but you can still transact in the way that you said, you know, is the advantage of all systems. Well I can I can do that with Zelly or Venmo. So I, I don't really need a stable coin for that. The stable coin I mean tether I think is 70 to 80 percent of the is the counterparty currency of 70 or 80 percent of, of crypto trades uh, because it circumvents all the difficulties attached with having a, a bank account in US dollars. Uh, but other than that, it has no no justification to exist. And um, uh, stable coins has made that. Uh, may I, may I, I just I, jump in and, and answer and mention mention just a few things in retort, if if you don't mind. So to answer your your scarcity platinum versus gold question, uh, central banks hold gold; they don't hold platinum. So there's a there's a large difference on the demand side. Um, also, the the reason I was interested in Bitcoin being a former gold dealer, and I and I actually built J.P. Morgan's platinum PGM business, platinum and palladium. So that's my area of expertise. Um, but prior to Bitcoin, there's no other asset in the world that that acts as a store of value, is, is issued uh, non by, by a non-government entity, has published its entire forward guidance for the life of the asset, um, uh, and it and is scarce. So I'm not saying that it's the end-all, be-all economic solution for the world, but Prior to Bitcoin, there was no way to put your money into an asset that had fixed forward guidance uh, and, and all of the above. That, that's that's what I wanted to mention. So, uh, so, so, so I guess that challenge there. Uh, I'm sorry, who's who's speaking? It's me, Pablo. No, just, okay. just one go on, one. Pablo. It's also uh, the confiscatory risk that you have with other assets that you don't have with Bitcoin because it's not controlled by any central entity. And for us, I mean, in Europe or even in the US, it might sound a little bit weird, but me covering uh, for many years the uh, Latin market, there is uh, this risk is huge. You no, know, if you if you go to Venezuela and, and uh, Bolivia and other countries, you no, know, uh, you have always this risk. You no, know? and we saw that with with Venezuela, for instance, or Cuba or whatever. You no, know? so for me, that has a tremendous value as well. Very good. I was also going to bring up the 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 you know the thought that you know it, it's true that there's a limited quantity of Bitcoin, right? But there's not a limited quantity of other cryptocurrencies out there, and new ones are invented and they come and go, uh, as we as we've seen. So, how does that affect the whole algebra here, uh, Frank? When you talk about crypto as a potential currency and having certain stores of value and things of that nature. I mean, each of these projects is individually like like an individual stock, but but the entire ecosystem is still so early that they all tend to correlate. They all go up, and as we all seen recently, now they're all down. That will play out over time, and 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 you, this correlation will break down based on individual projects, their merit, their user base, um, you know, the, the the usefulness of of the underlying token. 
there, each of these projects also has different tokenomics. As you mentioned, Bitcoin has 21 million uh, hard cap. Other one, you know, Ethereum has has more of an inflationary adjustment. So, um, uh, based on on voting internally in governance, that can adjust over time. So, they although they're all correlating now over the years, we will see individual projects break out. Gotcha. And I, I you know, the original question, John, I'm going to throw it your way because you're an investor. Was how does somebody find alpha in this? How do you make money in turbulent market times that we're now seeing? Do you just sit on the sidelines and wait for it to come back? What What are your thoughts here? I, I mean, you know, it, it's. I don't think it's. There's really not that much difference in there than what people would say is a legacy market or traditional markets than what's going on here. I mean, you look for bottoms. You look for you know weekends shaken out. You look for the number of liquidations that have occurred, and you say, okay, I think I think that's the most of it. And so I was just talking to somebody this morning about it. Uh, I know with the investor and he just asked me where and where. And I said, you know, look, I think the things you bring up, like he was talking about this Celsius and the Luna, and, you know, because BlockFi needed some stress help or whatever. You know, those are all white swans at this point. When you're in a, and I personally don't see too many more black swans. And when you're in a market where it's white swans, those are good times to invest because white swans can be managed. You know, it's the unknown thing that, that's going to spook you. And particularly if you see, something that's a white swan to you, but a black swan to somebody else, you know, obviously that's when you want to go long or short. But, you know, I think it's it's kind of finding a bottom. There's a very dominant thing going on right now that everybody knows about. It's called the Federal Reserve, the aggressive tightening program. So that's the most dominant thing, more dominant than Bitcoin or, or tech stocks or Apple mm -hmm. or anything else. And for the last couple of years, it's affected every single asset class I can imagine has been either positively or negatively or both affected by what the Federal Reserve is doing. So right now, Bitcoin is certainly not bigger than that. You know, it's part of that. And then to answer your, you know, your other specific question, the projects that you like, you know, when you have a distressed market and you think it's kind of settling down, well, now it's a good time to get back in. Um, you know, like, for example, I like Polygon. I think you use Polygon for you. I like Polygon, Matic is a token. It's, it's a very complementary to the Ethereum blockchain. Um, they're building bridges between them. I like the team. I've spoken to them. They're well capitalized. You know, so that's a token that's very interesting to me, right? As a, as a specific name, just to throw up. Just like I can look at stocks and I could say, you know what? Apple has so much money on their balance sheet. They're not going to go bankrupt. It's a good time to get back in, given how that stock's been whacked. You know, if anything, there's good support for an Apple because they have so much cash on their balance sheet. They're a logical buyer of their stock, right? And management's not going to let those stock options and the board, you know, expire worthless. So, you know, it's kind of that same thing. When, when there's, there's good traction and there's value, you know, you, you see times like this as buying opportunities. Um, you don't see it as if you really believe if you're in the in it for the right reason in the first place, because you had some belief in the fundamentals, which I certainly did, as I expressed at the beginning. This is not a time to bail. This is a time where you're going to do some of your best trades. Uh, and, and again, you know, you bring up some interesting points there, and I want to go to Pablo for just a minute, and then I want to circle back to uh, uh, to, to Anthony. So, Pablo. Uh, you, you're, you're playing around the golf. Sorry, Marty, it's not pickleball. Uh, with a friend of yours who heads up a family office. You're not an advisor, but he knows you You know the business. You're, you're here. He's had a large, he's built up a large holding of crypto coins through the years, primarily in Bitcoin and Ethereum. He's bought at various points in, over time, but has written the market down. You know, he's concerned about the economy. He's concerned about everything he's hearing. And he's, he's asking for your opinion about the crypto market. What, what are you saying to him? I mean, um, we've lived this situation before, no? And I remember uh, 2018, 2019, it was a, a disaster, no? Everything went down massively. People were, because the crypto market at that time was even smaller. So people were telling me, uh, this is a scam. I, I told you this is not going anywhere especially in Europe, that we are more conservative. Governments were saying that this, this was something that it was going to evolve because um, no one controlled it and you need regulation. Even uh, I was JP Morgan and even JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon, the CEO, was saying that he will fire uh, those in, investing in crypto or in Bitcoin. No? And at the end, the time has, proved, has proven that the technology is what matters here, mm -hmm. no? And um, following to Duke, and I think that to Joe, I think what is important is that we focus now on those projects that can bring value. Because obviously, when everything is, is going up in a bull market, 
just to have a lot of people building things that are basically smoke, but they just want to get advantage of the, you know, of the, the liquidity that is in the market and, and they just ride the wave, no? So I think for, for this specific uh, case, it would be interesting to see what this investor has in the portfolio and maybe uh, it's on those projects that are weaker and, and focus or, or condensate the, the, the portfolio in, in other projects or in other uh, coins like you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, that can be a, a, a safer bet, no? And regarding Polygon, for instance, it's a project also that I really like. I was with them in Davos, and, and I think these guys are building something solid, no? Um, and these are the type of projects that we need to look at. Anthony, I, I want to spin back to you here. And, you know, you we were discussing last night your company. You you chose to build on a certain platform, had certain reasons for it. So you want to chime in a little bit? Because I think that goes to a, a lot of, you know, what values are in coins and different types of things. Yeah. So I think Joe and Pablo cue me up nicely for that one, which is we're building on a platform called Polygon. Polygon is a proof of stake blockchain that sits on top of the Ethereum blockchain, which is considered to be proof of work, it requires a large amount of mathematical computation to mine blocks. Polygon does not require that the input of energy to validate transactions. So that means Polygon, its transactions are quicker, uh, cheaper, much more efficient, but it runs on the same technology that Ethereum does. So for example, our platform uses what's called smart contracts, which are essentially autonomously executing pieces of code to facilitate transactions. If we were, net, if we were going to do a transaction on Ethereum, which would require revenue shares and royalties to be sent to, let's say, 30 recipients that did music for a game, motion capture, story, what have you, uh, gas costs for that transaction on Ethereum could be in excess of $30. And if we're trying to sell small games for five bucks, well, you don't want to incur $30 of gas fees for a $5 game, it makes no sense. That same transaction happening on Polygon, the exact same recipients using the exact same smart contracts we can repurpose all of our code will cost six cents. And that's a much more tolerable kind of sales tax looking thing for a person purchasing a $5 game. And you know, for the gaming subs, I will say environmental impact of blockchain um, is a big reason why there's been a lot of negative sentiment in that space um, for people who aren't kind of bridging the blockchain side of things. Um, Polygon has made a commitment to be carbon negative by, you know, I guess next year, they're pretty much carbon neutral. So that's a, a good kind of feather in their cap. When we go back to looking at the value of some of these tokens, I want to double back to what you said, Joe. There's an entire ecosystem built around these things. So, you know, there's a lot of interest in blockchain and gaming now. That's where we live. Um, so if you wanted to say, well, I want to invest in that sector, well, there's plenty of individual projects to do so, but also look to where those platforms are building. Um, you might look to Polygon, where they have a $450 million gaming fund. They pulled over Ryan Wyatt from YouTube Gaming to, to run the whole program. Another one I would say to look at would be Mutable X, another extremely well-capitalized company out of Australia. They're supporting GameStop and their endeavors. And you can see kind of that a lot of these projects are, are trending towards Polygon, Mutable, and the last one I throw out there is, is Avalanche, which is compatible with Ethereum, mm -hmm. where Neil Stevenson, the author of Snow Crash, kind of the first author of the metaverse, is building their blockchain. So is the reason for blockchain being used in gaming for transaction purposes? I mean, it doesn't actually make games better, does it? It's it doesn't make the game better graphically, does it? Well, for, for certainly not graphic-wise. Uh, for now, I would say I would be hard-pressed to recommend any blockchain-focused game beyond like a AAA game you could buy on the Steam platform, it's a digital game store storefront. The problem I have with the blockchain gaming space is this, uh, everything's forming around this play-to-earn model, which is focused on transactions in games, um, less because it's a good thing to do where a player could own their currency within a game like gold in World of Warcraft, owning your item, some sword that you got in a game is a good thing for players, but creating the financial <laughs> loops inside of games completely predicated on payment is a bad thing. That's how we get games that are staking hundreds of millions of dollars of capital, but there's really minimal gameplay. And that's why our focus is on actually tokenizing the building blocks of game development is one of the things we haven't really just talked about, but we're working on with the Pulsinelli team is imbuing game assets with intellectual property rights. 
Um, so when I build something and go into someone else's game and they build with my stuff and they sell their game with my stuff in it, I can still receive my revenues based on that transaction. I can see the transaction happening in real time. I know who owns what. There's no more of these stories where people are getting ripped off from their, their names are being taken out of the credit sequence because they only worked on the first two years of the game's development instead of the entire five-year cycle and most recent three years. There's a ton of stories. I'll, I will spare you the soapbox because I want to filibuster here. I think, Mario, to answer your question more succinctly, the problem is for gaming, for blockchain gaming projects now, there's too much focus on transactions, not enough about fun gameplay, nor is it being used to actually build games faster, cheaper, more efficiently, with better accreditation for the builders themselves. So uh, and, I want to at I, least I, acknowledge. Ethereum is, 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 is Ethereum is centralized, right? No. Well, Ethereum is so decentralized, even the SEC had to say it was sufficiently decentralized. I, I, well, so you can, there's no limitation on how much Ethereum you can print, right? Like, so well, it's not so like Bitcoin, that right? goes back to what Alex was saying. Bitcoin has had, you know, there's going to be 21 million Bitcoin. There's a very kind of right, so half 19 life. million have been, you say 19 million, of which 5 million are lost? Well, or uh, uh, held by whales where we don't know the identity, like the, the inventor or the group of inventors, uh, uh, the exchanges, you know, uh, exchange short. short but, but, whales, you, but, but you can create Ethereum at nonstop, right? Well, I would say this that you can continue to mint Ethereum, but there are mechanics in place such that Ethereum is burned along the way. So you have this kind of mix of inflationary and deflationary economics where- There's no final number of Ethereum, no. right? No, not, not in- It's not 21 million. No. no. No, but with, with Ethereum 2.0, what they want to do is basically uh, transform it in a, into a deflationary uh, coin. The only thing is the transition to proof of stake. There are now some people arguing that since there are some different protocols holding a lot of Ethereum, this could affect the governance of the protocol, but in my opinion, it's not gonna be it's not gonna be the the case. But this uh, is a risk, obviously. And yeah, Frank, you look like you want to jump in here, so I'm gonna. Yeah, I mean, you know, Ethereum certainly has an inflationary model, and then once we move over to 2.0, uh, as mentioned, it will have both inflationary and deflationary economics. Um, it's not crazy though. I mean, I think the current inflation is around three and a half percent for, for there. So there's about three and a half percent a year uh, new Ethereum created. Um, you know, it, it's interesting though, for, for me, I'm actually, you know, we've had this down market. I'm actually have not touched Bitcoin on this move lower. I'm a little concerned that there's still quite a few leveraged longs out there, corporate longs and, and such. Ethereum, I'm buying a little bit every day because it's extremely transactional. So I can use it. I can go uh, put it into DeFi. I can buy NFTs for market research stuff that I do. I'm finding myself dipping in now in ETH because it is so transactional. Just thought I would mention that from an investment perspective. Well, and that sort of leads me into our, our next topic, which is crypto adoption. And people starting to use this in, in transactions, uh, also getting the institutional investors involved in payment systems and things along those lines. Um, so, uh, you know, it seems to me that there's a long way to still to go in this and crypto adoption is still rising. And, you know, Mike Novogratz, who was quite pessimistic on hedge funds in the crypto space, but very positive on the space itself because of the adoption rates that are happening. Is, is that continuing right now? And, and what are we seeing? <laughs> Frank, I'll, I'll toss that out to you to start. Yeah, I, I think, you know, well, certainly we, we've had some consolidation uh, in the space. The, the, the space is generally in, in a very bearish mood, but oftentimes what you find here is this is when we, we weed out the good from the bad. Builders keep building. Uh, from a venture perspective, it's extremely exciting because, um, you know, valuations have, have been slashed in the case of BlockFi, Ray, who raised 18 months ago on a $3.5 billion valuation, they just did about a close to a 70% down around uh, and raised recently at 1 billion. So there, there, is, there is opportunity here. And I would, would tend to agree with, with Novogratz and Galaxy, who by the way had exposure, had some exposures they shouldn't have with in the recent blow up um, in that th this is a great opportunity to find builders. Sure, and Joe, you want to comment, follow on? <clears throat> um. You know, I, 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 
question actually it, it touches so many things that maybe we're uh, uh, kind of realizing really how kind of broad that is. But um, let's start at the broadest, most kind of profound sounding thing that that question touches on, which is what did Bitcoin really do? You know, it changed the relationship of man, the government, right? Because up until this point, it was government who owned currency, controlled it, controlled the institutions for the most part. You know, that then for the last one hundred years, yes, yeah, for one hundred years, yeah. to, allow, to yeah. allow you to store and transfer it. So, Bitcoin makes it a Bitcoin makes it a let's a consumer product. So, what's the logical thing that happens with consumer products? You get a lot of competition. So, to me, that the fact that you have a lot of coins does not diminish the value of crypto or blockchain or Bitcoin in general. To me, it's it's a validation that it's onto something. That now we have a real competition amongst currencies. We don't have a central bank or a sovereign dominating. Right. So, you know, that's the good thing at the kind of the higher level. And, and again, I think it's the expected thing um, if you really understand what's happening here. Now, in terms of the adoption, I mean, yes, I, I personally do think there's too much time spent on the speculative aspect. Speculation is important. It's speculation is part of every good market. Can't get away from it. It's a good thing. It provides liquidity. But I do think there's there's been too much focus on that and less on the actual adoption. So, I mean, if, I think that, that's another part of your question. So. Yes, I'm I'm on I'm on board with that, um, and then it, it kind of it and, and again so one of the one of the uh, one of the reasons is because Bitcoin is it's difficult to scale it in its current format. It does around seven transactions a second. There are different alternatives that are taking place. So, you know, Lightning is one, which is I think um, you know it, it seems like Bitcoin is most committed to that, and you know, and I hope it works out. But again, we're back to more competitive model. There's there's different models, you know, doing different things using bigger block size, for example, using faster block time. Are using a different consensus mechanism instead of proof of work. You know, as some people talk about. I, I guess the question I have is: is, um, there, is there any data? Like, do we have data on on crypto adoption or blockchain adoption? I mean, like, like what's the what's the gross revenue of products that are being sold? Well, the, the no, best I, thing to look at is the best thing to look at is just on chain activity, right? Which is a really important metric. Which so again, that's transactions. It's wall. It, yeah, transactions of wallet. Book, right. But so is it transactions that, that make money? I don't know if they make money or not, but it's it's does a buying a dollar, you know, spending a dollar for coffee does that make money? I don't know. I don't know. It's transaction Israeli, volume. It's, Israeli gains it's not. It's not speculative. Making about half a billion dollars. Yeah, it's not a speculative. We don't know if those are making money. They're being used for some kind of payment. That's all we do know, right? But but you know, um, so there's a lot of a lot of different angles on it. A lot of competition. Yes, I mean, look, Dogecoin has a, has good adoption. If we want to think about, it, right? I mean, SpaceX. Oh, is using I, it. I'm, I'm asking about revenue. I, my question was revenue. Okay, hey, right. Marty, this, for, this, for a stat this, for this you if last, you this, want one. Yeah, this is the last point I want to make on this. Because like I said, Mark, your, your question really touched on a lot of things, maybe without mm -hmm. realizing. So the, the last point I want to make is kind of <coughs> how to value it, or, or you're asking about revenues, right? So when I work with high net worth individuals, you know, who are looking to get into this, and, and I'll ask detectives or consultant, you know, a lot of times they get very interested. They'll, they'll speak to a team, or, you know, they'll, they'll go through the math a little bit. And then, you know, they'll say, you know, I, I really, and what I'll hear quite often is, Joe, I really think there's something there, you know, but I just can't value it. I just can't pull the trigger yet because I just don't know how to value it. And these are people, a lot of times, are coming from traditional banking backgrounds, you know, so they're used to like discounted cash flow models, collateralized models, P multiples, those kind of things, which don't really neatly fit in the, in the protocols. So, and it, personally, me trying to help them, this was a problem I wanted to solve. I, I, it's not like I want them to, to do something you're uncomfortable with, but I don't want them not to do something just, just for this reason. So what I've come up with is basically a simple rule of thumb, which I think is the best, and I think it's it's fairly accurate. So let's look at Bitcoin, and, and I would call this a replacement model. So Bitcoin can be, you can replace a lot of things. You can replace central banks. What's a good proxy for central banks? Value of gold, $10 trillion, let's use that. It can replace banks for the payment. It can replace um, just the pure payment networks like a PayPal or Western Union or something like that. You add all these up and you get something close to around $20 trillion, right? So what's the value of Bitcoin right now? This is, this is back of the envelope, so I'm not going to factor in like, you know, coin dilution going forward. Bitcoin right now is about a half a trillion. So that's a 40x return that's basically there if Bitcoin makes it. Now, there's a lot of steps that they're going to have to take to get there. Yes, scalability and real adoption and all that kind of stuff. But if it does get it, that's 40x. Is it worth 1%, 2% of your portfolio for that kind of thing? You know, I mean, I, it, it reminds me of a quote by Paul Tudor Jones, who I'm sure you all know, the hedge fund manager. You know, he said, you know, when he started 
more aggressively buying Bitcoin a few years ago with the Fed tightening. He said, you know, look, I don't get all the fundamentals now, but the fundamentals, they reveal themselves over time. And that, that's really one of the quotes that really stayed with me. I, I thinking, just, thinking you can know all the fundamentals in advance and then and then wait for it, it's kind of a fool's goal. And even Jim Simon, the Renaissance, I, I, has I, made I, similar noise. So I think this replacement no, 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 model I, I, is I, I, a nice I, way to get people comfortable. Time's up. So I think my other question was, um, what's the leverage? Do we, do we know what the leverage is in the system? Because I mean, uh, so again, I got to preface this. Our group's been in crypto since 2014, right? We, we know Novogratz. We know Dan Morehead. We know blockchain capital. We know Barry Silver. Those guys have all presented to us. So what's the leverage in the system? Does anybody have a number? How much money did hodlers borrow to buy Bitcoin? Is that or any crypto? Because that's going to predict what the downfall is. It's hard to say, and, and, and to be honest, it, it's been part of my concern, and we've seen it play out and effectively played out with Luna. So, you know, with all the decentralized finance that's come out, a lot of these are building blocks, Legos on top of Legos. So you can like deposit ETH and take out USDC, and then you can, you know, or you could you could be, go into an LP uh, AMM, or what they know known as an automated market maker, deposit ETH and USDC in similar amounts, get an LP token, deposit that token, receive a reward. There's there's been far too much leverage, so it, it doesn't surprise me. MakerDAO, which is which is probably um, the, you know the the stalwart in in the ecosystem, issuing issuing sure. DAI is a stablecoin. You know Maker, right? It, they even had a problem. So you recall the problem they had, where where it depegged. Uh, then then at some point DAI was trading at a premium. Like there is a lot of leverage. It's hard to say. We don't have proper regulation, so it's not like the regulators have come out and said, oh. Okay, no three, no two X leverage ever, right? So we're we're waiting for all that guidance. In the meantime, this building has happened, and there is in there is excess leverage. I agree. Right. So it's it's, it's the leverage is the contagion, right? Because people don't know how much the other guy borrowed for it, right? And mm -hmm. and then there's the fact that the banks have been lending on crypto assets. Yeah. Right. I, I, the, so, so it, I'm, it, I'm just trying to measure what's. The likely yeah, but Marty, Marty, going to fall. that's kind of an unfair question because let's let's go. Do you know how much leverage is in stocks? Well, all the dark markets, it's all backed by you know how, do, do the you know how, States, how or or the derivatives, you know how much leverage in OTC, derivatives, OTC. The the commodity trade. Did but, you know all this in the credit crisis? Mark, I mean, I think it's a little, here. it's a little, the, little the, the difference here is there's no one that's going to come in and 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 back Luna, it's gone. We move on, it's gone, right? So, and that's the point. Is Good, it it leverage, what happened to Luna? Is it leverage or it is misunderstanding of multipliers? These are two completely different things. Because when you're talking about the stock, I bought the stock, I leveraged it with cash, right? When I use that cash to leverage something else and that cash leverage something else, it is not leverage. It is something else. It's a multiplier, right? And it's an unknown category except for those who already have been this in the banking sector where one bank would borrow from another bank and present that uh, promissory note as a capital to another. No, no I get it. And it happens in all markets. I'm, that's I'm just trying point. to measure contagion. That's right. all. That's the contagion. That's how I'm just right. trying to understand it. And nobody has yet given me a leverage number. Yeah. Because I don't yeah. know. Because all I know, because I, I think it, I think Bitcoin goes down to four or three thousand, right? Because I think everybody I know borrowed to buy more Bitcoin, and that they were incremental buyers, and they incrementally forced the price up. And, and then those guys are washed out, right? They bought it at sixty thousand, right? Yeah, so. and you may be, and you may be right on that, Marty. I just. I don't think there's any place that has that information because it is a decentralized, um, you know, it is a decentralized asset, right? It's the whole point of it is nobody is, you know, it's harder to gather information on how much of that is going on and, and what's happening. Uh, you know, certainly government regulations could come in and help stabilize the market and, and do those things. And that would be a positive. Why is Bitcoin not at its issue price? What is are, are we, what the price? The at? original price was zero dollars. It's free. Yeah. It's free. <laughs> I just had a laptop in mind. Yeah. So, so, but the assets behind it. There are the network. No assets. <laughs> Simply, I mean, you have to value. Well, you could value the network, no? You know, all I know, let's the say- cost no, of energy to create it, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, that's a way to value yeah. it. Right, right. The cost of energy, yeah. Yeah, so- well, The cost of the waste. Yeah, so- uh, So the, the, the question is, why is it, why is it, and it, obviously it's because it's demand for, for the asset, 
for that people want to hold it in there and that's what gives it its value uh so that's that's i think the short quick answer to that it's not it hasn't been adopted enough to, to think of like a fiat valuation like you know dollars u.s dollars not going to go down much because there's so much trade activity with the u.s you know it's not going to go down much more than the gdp for a very long period of time but as i've said i'd like to see bitcoin be much more adopted as well because now you could have something that looks more fundamental in nature of pushback right with I'm, I'm more gonna, things denominated and natively transacted in. i'm going to restate my question and i'm not going to say it's about the leverage do you think that what happened with maker and these other coins that have collapsed or you know institutions that have collapsed in the last month is that uh the first inning or is it the ninth inning of of what is in this uh you know ball of yarn so to speak or you know, are we in the first inning of that of finding out? Well, I, I, I don't, I'm not the expert here, so I'll let these gentlemen <laughs> respond to your question. But I just want to give this thought to you or add it to your question, if you will. Uh, you know, I think we're early in this this whole, re, you know, this whatever we're in, whether it's a recession or or whatever it is. Uh, and I and even though it's disassociated from fiats, it is still, you know, it still trades in a ratio to fiats, right? same as any other fiat would trade in, in relationship to another fiat. So there is there is a uh, a compounding or, or a, a correlation between the two, right? Uh, as to what's going to take place. So I, if your question sort of goes, are we in the first inning or the ninth inning? Well, some of that depends on where we are as an economic in, in our economy too. So I'm throwing that into the, the mix there. And feel, uh, Pablo, you've, you've been on the sidelines, and Alex, you've been on the sideline. Love to hear your thoughts on this. So why don't you gentlemen step in? Can I just rephrase what you said, Mark? Interest sure. rates are going to go to three, uh, you know, we're increased by 75 basis points. Somebody, I think Tyson predicted they're going to go up another 75 basis points. Correct, Tyson? And, and, and what happens to shoot another 75, and then, then we'll see where it goes from there, probably 50. Exactly right. So when that next step happens, how many more of these things are we going to find? find? Exactly. So Pablo and and, uh, and Alex, why don't you, you take it away? Alex, please, to resign. Well, <laughs> if, if you look, look at the correlation uh, between Bitcoin and the S&P 500, it, it's at 0.91 right now, and especially on uh, uh, periods when uh, stock market goes down, the, the correlation goes up. It, it's just a, a, a proxy for for a technology stock at this point, and even a, a leveraged one. So uh, it, it has become a just a play ball of, of speculation. I can take it very serious as, as a uh, as a store of value at this point. And uh, an another roadblock to more adoption, which would potentially introduce it as, as, a, as, as, as a money alternative, is um, uh, when, I, uh, when I take a dollar, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, a liability of the Federal Reserve. If I, if I take it to the bank, it becomes a liability of the bank. It is impossible in our current system to create savings without creating a corresponding debt at the same time. Mm -hmm. A Bitcoin, it, like a gold coin, is nobody else's debt. So if let's assume Bitcoin becomes the new monetary standard uh, and, and uh, how are uh, uh, municipalities, cities, governments gonna finance themselves? They, would be, they, they cannot issue Bitcoin, they will be forced to run a balanced budget, and um, uh, I, uh, I heard a lot of people from uh, IMF and, and uh, central banking service said this: uh, people are going to die because hospitals won't be able to build. And uh, I think this is the greatest impediment to adoption of Bitcoin, because uh, in in, a, in Bitcoin you can, uh, uh, you cannot have Bitcoin-based debt. Also for the reason, if, if you think about the year 2140 or whenever all 21 million are issued, let's assume that some of us have uh, loans in Bitcoin and we have to pay them back to the people who lend it to us, uh, including interest. Where's that interest in Bitcoin gonna come from? It's impossible. In, in our system, if we need interest, we just create more money, which creates more savings at the same time. In Bitcoin, it's impossible. 
So that's, that's what I see as the biggest impediment as, as uh, broad adoption. And then, and then it will just remain a play ball of speculation. So what, what proportion of, of current holders of Bitcoin do you think are fundamental holders versus speculators? Or uh, retailers is 100% speculators and the, the, uh, the whales, um, uh, they, these addresses don't, don't move anything. So it's a total bifurcation, but- uh, what, I mean. what, what, so what percent of that is on by whales, whales versus- yeah. I, uh, the percentage is, is uh, pretty high, I think as much as 50%. So even if you say that this is the money of the future, the distribution would be very unjust and you would just continue with wealth inequality and, and you could even say that that's why Bitcoin is undesirable. It's really fascinating. <laughs> and, uh, you know, great <laughs> questions, guys. So again, Mark, great job. Thanks so much. Well, it was a very interesting discussion. The, I really enjoyed the back and forth among them. We Marty put together a terrific panel. I thank Anthony, uh, Frank, Alex, and Joe, and Pablo for, for their great insights during this. And uh, I, th I thought it was a great discussion.